Yeah, you really need to dress the dog, Paul. Yeah. You I, can't have a naked, can't have a naked dog. It's a problem in these Zooms in the past. <laughs> After there's a lot of complaints. <laughs> I mean, you, you and I could only be half dressed. Nobody's going to know. Yeah, that's well, yes, dude. <laughs> <laughs> that's just. I don't know how you can, roll. <laughs> we can keep that between ourselves. I, I haven't dressed the bottom in ten weeks. <laughs> So we'll uh, I'll uh, we'll hold off a minute until more people uh, are in, but I see you know a good number of people are joining us. Uh, yeah, we're up to a hundred people, so I'll, I'll give people another couple minutes and then we'll start. Well, you actually have an adding machine with, uh, with a roll of paper behind you. That's old school. I know. Well, we haven't been out of the house in four years. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, maybe it's 10. I can't remember. I've lost all prior of time. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> All right, so it's three after, so let's two more minutes and then we'll get rolling. Okay. Lord, really, my glasses really, look at these squares. It's my computer. Yeah, you look slightly possessed. Yeah, that's a problem. Well, if you turn on the light next to it. Maybe that's better. That's a little better, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's the computer. Are you in the studio behind your house? Uh, that no. Safe behind your house? No, this is, it's the, it's been Karen's office for oh. uh, a long time, years. Before I moved to the studio. It was Mara's bedroom, and then Mara oh. left, you know? She, right. She took off. We don't blame her. But. She, she didn't go far. Well, she has at times, but right she now she's, right. she's like, you know, you could throw a rock and hit her house. Not quite. She's pretty close. So is Damon. I remember Damon saying he was, there was no reason really to leave Pasadena. <laughs> yeah. When he was in high school. That's, that's, yeah. You, know, you, you want your kids to feel that way, to stay close. Yeah, it was like the whole group of them. I, I think nearly all of them stayed here, this whole little, you know, gang of skateboarders, you know, just stayed in LA, you know? Yeah. Stayed in Pasadena, really, a lot of them. Pasadena. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, all right, so we're up to about 140 people. So I think let's go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, I'm, I, I should just say, you know, we're in a completely new realm of public events here, um, virtually. And um, just to thank everybody who's, who's already here uh, for coming to listen to us today. Uh, we're coming to you live from, uh, respectively, from Altadena, California, and from Park Slope, Brooklyn. Um, and Paul and I thought that we would just talk a little bit today about his work and his thinking about the work of Philip Guston. Um, and, you know, I think both of those bodies of work are, are pretty relevant to um, uh, going through upheavals like the kind of upheaval that we're going through right now. Um, I, uh, I've, I've been thinking about Paul's work for a long time. I remember in 1997, I saw a Santa chocolate shop at the Whitney Biennial, uh, you know, as a set and a sculpture and a film. And it was truly unlike anything I'd seen in the art world up to that point. And, and it was unlike any associations that I had ever had or ever thought I'd have with Santa and his elves. Um, but then in 2013, I got to spend a year off and on watching Paul create uh, W.S. or White Snow, which, which I still think of as one of the more seminal works to have come out of L.A. in the last several decades uh, about the idea of Hollywood and specifically the, the Disney version of Hollywood and what that idea has meant in um, shaping American culture and identity for better and often for worse. Um, and so I thought maybe, Paul, you and I could start out talking about, I remember one time at some opening, you talked about the importance of the idea of delirium for you and your work, and about how the understanding that an artist can try to gain about the human condition by moving around within delirium, uh, the, the delirious. And, you know, when you look at your work and you look at Guston's post 1970s paintings, those are certainly a landscape of delirium. You know, these mouthless one eyed heads and these forests of gaunt legs and piles of shoes and cigar smoking thugs. Um, so that might be one place we could start is just this, this idea of working in the space of delirium. And, you know, we in the, the situation that the world is in right now, it's, it's one, you know, the delirium seems kind of relevant. Um, well, and what does delirium mean to you, uh, that space as an artist? Oh, I didn't see that question coming. Um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, and, and I'm not, I, I don't know, it, you know, the subject of delirium and and Guston. Um, you, you know, I I think of my own work. Uh, the subject of delirium is in the work, in my work, has been there. You know, the the the, the thing of spinning. And um, it, which is the first videotape I ever made, I think in probably late 1969 or early 70. Um, and it's the first, I remember the camera was in the room and we were, you know, was in a empty room and there was me and another guy and we had just got this port a pack and uh, no, we didn't have, a, we had another, we were in the USC medical center is where we were and we were in their television studio. And there was a technician, that's how that one went down. And I just started spinning. And as a react, well, I think the first thing I did was bounce against the wall, just kept bouncing against the wall. And a kind of a, re a repetition. And I think I was making a kind of groaning sound and I just kept bouncing against the wall. And then that turned into spinning. And, um, a, you know, it, it's a, a, a kind of keynote for, you know, the performances 
that I made during that whole period of the 70s. And prior to that, the, the, the thing of painting, uh, I often painted and, you know, on the ground, on top of the paintings. And the paintings were all like, you know, like big sheets of masonite. So like four by eight, uh, eight by eight, eight by 12. So they were like arenas on the ground. Like it, they kind of made us and I could perf perform on them. At the time, I didn't think of it as performance per se, but I was aware of the state of, of uh, repeating uh, a sound, repeating words, and painting in a way where I kind of removed myself from uh, a kind of... Uh, analytical state of some sort of some sort of conscious state so and that kind of delirium and that kind of work is uh it's just gone all the way till now and uh, to the present is and it has something to do with removing myself and getting into a, a kind of state. It's, I don't, you know, these words like trance and all that, I, I don't use them because I don't, I, you know, I some, at one point I defined trance as being a highly focused, a very focused state mm -hmm. in which everything else kind of dissipates or leaves. So there maybe covers the subject of delirium and I've made a lot of pieces about it's just, it's always in the work in some form or another, and it creeps in and creeps out. And, and uh, you know, the pieces now of drawing in a, in a, in a, as a kind of character, that's, uh, you know, that's there. How I see Guston, you know, well, and, there... And not, not to interrupt yeah. you, but, you know, you think that's 1969, you're talking about making that spinning piece. And, you know, I think... You know, he had that show in 1970 at Marlboro that was the break that, you know, it was w where he went figurative, um, but he was making those works in 69. So it's the same period of time you're thinking about, you know, where he, he, he began to, to do that body of post-1970 work that was completely different. Yeah. And, I, and yeah. do you remember when you do you remember first seeing those the you know the 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 figurative cartoon kkk oh, you know oh those way words? later way later yeah. i mean i you know in, in a lot of ways uh, uh, there <clears throat> you know the older abstraction of gustin that i was familiar with at the time the 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 caricature cartoon well what do you call it, figurative work uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not sure when I knew that work, but much later. I, th I think probably in the 80s. I, yeah. I, I don't think I, you know, my brain, it, it was, I remember there was a period, you know, in the late 70s and 80s where when I was very interested in, in the late 70s in Pacabia and the paintings mm -hmm. of Pacabia, there was a mm -hmm. kind of in my brain, there was there was always painting. <clears throat> as uh, you know, I I, I begin as a painter, and uh, and in the paintings I made in the seventies, uh, in, in the sixties, I mean, in the sixty five through sixty nine, were very were very uh, much about what was happening in society at the time. I mean, they were. Mm -hmm. You know, I would light them on fire. They were all black. There was Ed Reinhardt, um, an interest in Ed Reinhardt. And, and then this thing of, and they were, they went from figurative to all black. The, the transition from 65 to 70 went from figurative to all black. The end mm -hmm. ones were all black. And then that was just prior to moving to San Francisco. And in, in the late 60s, 68, 69. And, and then I went back to making figurative work uh, when I went to San Francisco. And uh, 
So it was a transition from figurative to all black in the in the in these early figurative paintings. Uh, mm -hmm. Subjects of machines and stacked, stacking objects, piling up objects, piling things uh, in a in like a totem sort of fashion. And they went from figuratives to all black. And then I went back to figurative, going to San Francisco, I returned back to figurative, but quickly in 68, 69, my work. It, performance in, uh, in experimental films had been there since uh, 66, 67, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But um, it, I, you know, when I go after, in San Francisco, I go, it, the work becomes less about painting and I go straight into perf uh, performance, video, uh, um, art and life, uh, pieces on the street, you know, all that, all that. And then that continues all the way up until the 80s. And yeah. then the 80s happen and Reaganomics happens. And I think it's the crash of the alternative art world in the beginning of what we know now as the gallery system. It really right. kicked into gear in, in the 80s. And, and corresponding to Reaganomics, I think, uh, and it's the end of the alternative art world. And at that point, I sort of leave performance. So I, I leave it in the sense of performing in public. And I then go to performing in front of the camera. Yeah. But, uh, you know, with Gustin, it's when I go back to uh, in the 80s, uh, I begin to paint again. And... Mm -hmm. uh, I'd been drawing in the 70s, but I really start painting again in the 80s. And it kind of is, you know, it's, it's a relation, it's like going back into the studio in, in a certain way. And also I have kids and then it's like, you know, like I'm in, you know, a shitty job. So yeah. I go back into the studio and I start painting again. And at that point, uh, you know, I was, I was aware of like polka and stuff like that. That had been, and you know, to a degree, Sally and Schnabel, all this had been going on, right? Yeah. Or starts going on. And so, and a number of artists I knew, Burden, Conchi, and all this stuff had in a way left that whole world of performance. Whether they left the world of the alternative art world or the concern for that is another thing, but performing kind of, you know, and by that point, people like, you know, the Viennese actionists had in a way stopped. I mean, to, yeah. you know, maybe not Nietzsche and Mule, but, um, you know, it, it, it was a switch in that 80s period. And at that point, I think sometime in there, I become aware of uh, Gustin. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think about those paintings because like Boslitz uh, and like Clemente, it, it was, there was a return to the figurative. And a lot of times I thought, you know, especially in the case of Clemente and uh, Boslitz, I thought there was a real association to performance. Those early paintings of Boslitz, like I had done performances in, this, uh, in the 70s that the character I was in the performance was reminiscent of these characters that Boslitz was painting these sort of, uh, like as if they were standing in mud, right? Like the yeah. subject of mud and the subject of uh, being in a landscape and all that. And this, uh, and, and in a way with Boselitz, it's a return to World War II, it's coming out of that. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, you know, and I, and I think with Gustin, it's, you know, these figurative paintings, it's coming out of Vietnam, right? It's coming out of that yeah. concern. It's coming from that. Yeah. And but on the same time, you know, I think, you know, I've always seen Gustin's work. You know, I, I remember when I first saw these piles of shoes and these legs, the legs. It's, yeah. You can't just call them shoes. There's legs. Right. The and legs. These, these piles, it, for me, there was, a, 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 you know, I couldn't help it. I mean, one way it's very subjective. I have to see it as subjective. It's how I look at Gustin, 
right? You know, I look at Gustin in a number of ways. There's a number of different reads for me about Gustin. As in a lot of artists, like you can't just pin them down to one read in a way. It's like where my head's at as a viewer or what I'm thinking about or how I relate to this thing that's in front of me. But with, with Gustin, this pile of legs and all of that, it was very like, you know, I couldn't separate it from uh, images of concentration camps, right? right. And that, uh, that type of imagery, right? And, you know, it, it's, it's some kind of thing where, and you really see it when you kind of, when you think about Gustin and here you are as you're an abstract painter and a very famous one and a very good one. Yeah. And you're painting these paintings and, and then you, you, this social situation is happening, this cultural, you know, at the time, you know, not unlike what we are right now, the war in Vietnam, every night on the news, uh, the number yeah. of deaths, uh, all of this, the unrest, uh, right. the, the, the civil, civil rights, rights movement, movement going on. All, yeah. all of this going on, right? And, you know, and in a way, if you, and there's all these quotes from Gustin about, uh, about, uh, about how to, like, he couldn't help it. He had to do that. Yeah. And it's a shift that he makes. And it's, a, you know, he's questioning his own paintings. He's, uh, you know, the questioning of abstraction. He questions, you know, the, why continue as an abstract painter? Like, yeah. why continue? Well, and and you know, it, it's, it's for himself to question why continue. And on the other hand, he's actually questioning the whole movement of abstraction in yeah. this situation, right? And, right. and, and it, you know, that, uh, and it, you know, in a lot of ways, so, you know, you look at these blobs, like the one that's up there right now, this square blob of legs and what shoes, uh, taps, whatever those uh, things are, yeah. and feet of some sort. And um, they're not, they, they come out of the abstractions, like, you know, there are, you know, those blob squares, like there's a really amazing one that's all gray with this pink square. And, you know, yeah. in that abstract period from an earlier period, but it's, it's I think, Gustin has a, a kind of crisis there, right? Yeah. In, in what, what art is, and, and then he retreats into a studio, right? Like, I mean, he'd always been a studio artist, but it's not like he's, you know, he has a question, it goes that way, and he doesn't come out of it. Yeah. It's not like he begins to say to himself, should I go back and paint an abstract painting just yeah. for the hell of yeah, it? The Should I go world. back and paint an abstract painting to make money? He just goes into this thing. Well, and you know, and I was going to add what it's was quite deep how he goes in. Yeah, and I was going to add what you know. People don't think of him so much as as being uh, from Los Angeles, but you know, he he spent his formative his teenage years there, and and I remember seeing, you know, the figure of the clan, the hooded clan figure. There was a yeah. drawing. There was a drawing that he did. I think when he was seventeen, that was yeah. you know a, a very uh, you know sort of social realist uh, view of the Klan, and it was because I think he had seen Klan members marching in Los Angeles as a teenager, and yeah. you think about how you think about how deeply embedded that figure, that ominous figure of sort of a, a quintessential American evil, and how he never let it go, and then it came back again. Uh, you know, it came back again as a as an obsessional sort of motif in all these paintings post seventies. Yeah, and that that was in L.A. You think that wasn't even in the Deep South? That was that was L.A. That he saw that uh, that the Klan that that hooded figure became a uh, you know a real pivotal thing for him. Yeah, and I think one of the things interesting about that is how he talks about it, and it's a really, I think. It's the same with, you know, the the sort of bulbous one-eyed 
figure that is sitting there asleep, the one, the image that's up there right now. Yeah. But, you know, in, in both cases, he talks about it. This gets really, you know, somebody can say, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. He says, you know, he sees them as self-portraits. There's a self-portrait and then he's in there somehow, right? Yeah. And, and, and that has, you know, like in one way, you kind of you kind of know that image of the clan. He, it's like deeply insetted in him and he mm -hmm. has to deal with it, right? And by dealing with it, he gets something back, right? Like that's one of the reasons this happens. He has to, he, he does it because he gets something back from it. And yeah. it, it's, it's like he's, he's making these images because they speak to him, right? Yeah. And he can't help but the, the clan is in, it's in his brain. It's like that image went in and yeah. he has to deal with that. And at the same, that's one way of looking at why he might refer to it as a self-portrait. And it's not to say that he's a, a, a racist. It's not. It's not about that. It's about how that image gets inside of him and how potent images can be to affect yeah. who we are. And the other part to that, which I've often thought, is that we're, as, a, as, as people in a society that is racist and has racist overtones in it, one of the things about that is, is how we're trapped in a complacency. Yeah. And I think that's one of the I, things. And you and I have talked about this about. the other day about how he's not outside of it. He's he's in this world. Yeah, he's he's trapped he's in, the, in, at this, it in a outside. form of complacency. He can't, what does he do? You know, and he even says that when he comes back from Italy, he talks about like, what do I do? Do you know, like, how do I affect such a big machine? right? And the machine of society. And it, it's like, what do you do? And you're, you're kind of, fum you know, like in Western society, we fumble, even if we end up going out in the woods and living in a cabin, it's, you're still stuck in this situation. And if you're living in the city, you buy things, you get on this thing, you do this thing, you participate. And right. the, the idea that you can separate yourself from this machine is really difficult. Being in the machine consequently means you affect the outside. You affect who you affect cultures in 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 you know in South America, in Africa, in India, wherever you are, you're affecting those people, how they live, and yeah. and it's a, it's a you know, part of it is, and then I think there's really, you know, for me, those images of him lying on his back, looking up, it's, it, yeah, it's, 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 it's of, sitting in a bed. It's like you. There's a kind of it, impotence it, there. There's an impotence and a depressing, they're depressing, right? Right. Because I think in that there's a, there's the overwhelming situation creates these images of that are like depressing like he's laying there a character is laying there a cigar in bed food on his lap and the pile you know and so it, and all of this is i guess in one way my you know a read i have on all this and yeah. and uh, it's how you know i function around his work, how, how I see it, how it relates to what I might be doing too. Well, you, you talked to me too about, about the, the color, that, that sort of that raw uh, pink that, you know, that was a, uh, a color uh, that he used in abstraction and then it, it, it migrated onto the flesh in these figures. And the, the, you know. that raw pink and then also a you know a pretty blood red a meaty blood yeah, red maybe the image that that, was prior to this yeah let's maybe let's go back to that um yeah those, well, those that one there's another one those pinks next. which are like you know uh, which are really, <laughs> yeah, there we go. 
the, the, yeah. the, the you know a very much augustine color um yeah. you, you were talking to me the other day about how you in a way you see that pink almost as a as a uh, it's showing the sort of complacency that you can't get outside of your trap <laughs> it's almost like you're you're stuck in this kind of ooze that yeah. a complacency that even if you try you have a difficult time figuring out how to be outside of it yeah and I, I think and then you know i it's you know i don't you know the color pink and these things that he used in abstraction but also it becomes so dominant in a lot of these paintings not all of them but in a lot of them the, the color of this kind of pinkish color and this really blood red and, yeah. and it you know it the painting itself reads a body but his body you know it i think it's him you know that's how i see it and, and i don't know and it's not like i see it that way because it it you know i don't know whether it's really him <laughs> yeah. i don't know whether he sees it as him right. uh, that's like something else it's what is what happens when i look at it right like yeah. i go whoa that's like it's like it's like it's a, a, a square of skin and in that are these blood lines and and it's you know there's ultimately for me and especially you get into these paintings where there's the black sky and there you just get into it's an apocalyptic image yeah you know it's nighttime but it's very apocalyptic and it's uh, it's the image of of you know i mean there they're documents of how he sees the period of time, I think, and they're documents of, of uh, where we could be headed or where yeah. it could be. I mean, yeah. who the, you know, does he know? He only can react with his feelings. And, and uh, I, I really think that uh, the, the, uh, and then you have this, you know, they're within and it, how they were misunderstood is amazing to me because yeah. in a way they get by this uh, the this sort of and he talks about the you know in one way he he says well there's a there's a there's a, a type of a control and fascism in within society or the system I mean it's very much you know like I look at it as a spectacle like we're caught in a spectacle and uh, you know who's in charge here I don't know you know like in a way the yeah. Nixon drawings those are those are drawings of buffoons right Nixon's a yeah. buffoon that's what he is in these things right. he's a dick he's only a dick right. and I, he's a buffoon dick and uh, he it's like who's in charge? Well, the fucking spectacle's in charge, and yeah. and it, there lies the whole situation. It's the spectacle. And, and, I, and I think you too, when you were talking earlier about you know a pop, the, the, when when the Gustin paintings really did get to an almost apocalyptic vision, um, maybe we could show you know there was this work that you talked to me about that were was for was might have been in the 2013 uh, Venice Biennale, which was going yeah. to be a barge with- Maybe you can go up, go up a couple more images. Inflatable figures. One more. Um, that, that end up being, you know, there's severed, One more. Severed, severed heads and legs. Yeah, um, this one, yeah. And, you know, the, that, that, I mean, that comes out of, uh, of parts of your, of discrete parts of your work. But, you know, if you'd seen this floating down the, the you know, the canal, the Grand Canal in Venice, uh, 17 feet high in, you know, inflatable body parts like this, it's a, it's a very apocalyptic vision. Well, I think at the time, you know, like when I made this, it, it was kind of part, there was a, you know, there, it was the Venice Biennale, there was a, a Maximiliano was doing, uh, was curating and, yeah. And I think it was, a, it had something, as I remember, circus or carnival, I can't remember. And I, at the time I had been, you know, I had, I think I'd done uh, Piccadilly, which in Piccadilly, the, you know, there was the Bush character and I, and I had done the pirate, the Caribbean pirate piece. And in all of those, 
And prior to that, in a number of other pieces, there was a whole chopping off of foots and leg, a foot and a leg and a hand and a head. It was all about this uh, cutting up the body. And, and it had happened in, in those, both of those kind of extended video pieces. And so when I got asked, I made this model and it was to, these would be, in, it would be an inflatables. And I wasn't sure of what color they were going to be. Maybe the kind of color is, it kind of is right now in this clay color. And it was a very crude model. And the inflatable would be about, you know, 60, 70 feet tall and sit on a bar. Oh, yeah, that even bigger than I was saying. Yeah, like Much 60, 70 feet. And it would float, you know, through the canal or the big canal. And um, it never happened, uh, you know, too, maybe, I don't know, too expensive, the, the wrong image. Um, and when I did that, it, it, I didn't, it wasn't a response to, to Gustiner. I wasn't even thinking about Gustiner. It was really just this uh, kind of response to these past pieces I'd made of the cut off legs and feet and uh, hands and heads of and uh, uh, it was like a response, it was kind of a continuation of that. Then of course I do it. And then a couple of years later, I kind of go, whoa, that's a similar image, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, it has uh, connections uh, to this kind of gust and imagery, you know, that I, mean, I didn't put together at the time, you know? And do you know, over the last, let's say four years, um, I mean, do you feel like uh, that the apocalyptic imagery has has taken a more prominent position in your work? I mean, it, I, it, it, I mean, I'm thinking about some of the pieces that I've seen that you working on, you know, films and, and drawings. Uh, um, but that there is, a, to me at least, a greater sense of kind of... Um, not exactly hopelessness, but a real, but a real apocalyptic vision. Um, I, I think these are paintings that I did at one point, but, um, and, and they're quite large. Those things are like 12 feet tall. Uh, um, the, you know, it, the, I think all of the work I've done, it, you know, it, it had, you know, from the very beginning, there was this sort of this, you know, and, it, and it, you could call it a, a kind of form of delirium in the sense of dropping into a hole. And, um, I, you know, a, a kind of real questioning of, of uh, I guess, of male conditioning. That's one part of it. I, I kind of escaped that one. It's like, you know, somehow it's been, it's been shoved down my throat, and mm -hmm. and uh, what do I do with it? And uh, so, yeah, this thing of dealing with the patriarchy, and at the same time, it's it's not just, it's it's dealing with the patriarchal and the institution, and uh, trying to. Uh, uh, grapple with it. And um, I think, yes, it's, uh, there is a, a kind of apocalyptic sense to it, right? Maybe, yeah. yeah, like these things kind of like, if you go, maybe go back a little bit, see if we can get, I don't know where these things are. <laughs> these are like I mean, this piece about Trump, you know? Well, I mean, I was going to say, you've, you, you know, Gustin had had this obsession with Nixon that came out in those drawings, and you've yeah. taken on presidents as sort of buffoon figureheads going back at least to Reagan, and then a huge amount of, of work about Bush, obviously, and then in recent years, Trump. Um, and d d does the does the Trump-based work feel more apocalyptic to you, or does it is, is sort of like a sense that He's just, he's yet another in a line of, of these kind of buffoon figureheads that embody the system. I, 
I mean, it, you know, like the, the, those drawings of, of um, <clears throat> the, the Nixon drawings, right, <laughs> of Guston, right, and yeah, and it, you know, it, I and you know, I, I mind sort of begin. I, the first president that I kind of even dealt with was Carter, and um, who's an unlikely and, buffoon. Yeah, but it was at a time, you know, Carter and the the the, the situation in Iran, and I remember I made this piece. Uh, which was called A Tale to Two Cities, A Demonstration of American Politics. And it's where I, as Carter, went to, went to Florence and promised to Florence in, at the Communist Center, um, the, like their meeting hall to a, an audience, I promised as Carter to, to give them, uh, to supply them with uh, uh, arms and advisors in their war against Rome. And then I went to Rome and promised it to Rome uh, to, in their war against Florence, kind of making this issue about these territories, Florence and Rome and their, you know, their kind of ongoing bickering. And I'd made one about San Francisco and LA and their bickering called, it was called San Francisco, the shithole of the universe. And it was about how LA and San Francisco in a way at that moment really hated each other. Mm -hmm. San Francisco hated this Hollywood and Hollywood hated that kind of uh, bog uh, ceramics and a, you know, like this kind of bickering. And so I make this piece and, and then when, you know, when Bush went into Iraq, I, it came up as a joke, you know, I was kind of saying, I was uh, looking at a building to make a film and the room upstairs was called the American room and the, and there was three, the building had three levels and I said, oh, wow, well, uh, Bush in, on the third floor, the queen on the, uh, in the middle, and Damon, who I was with, who was my son, who we were, were going to shoot this film, said, and Ben Laden in the basement. Mm -hmm. And I thought at the moment, I can't make that piece. I can't do it because it, it's too blatant. Like I'm dealing with too blatant an object, too blatant a thing. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, I have to be more subtle as an artist. I can't just take on that blatant cartoon subject. But once it's like, once the rat is out of the cage, you're stuck with it. And mm -hmm. I just went, shit, I have to do it. It's like, the, yeah. it's open, right? So I made the piece about Bush and, yeah. you, know, it, 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 you know, it's interesting with Gustin where you get, I get that sense with his, with his Nixon drawings that he, that he, he didn't necessarily want to do that many drawings. He just couldn't stop. He couldn't, you know, like when you talk about the rat being out of the cage, oh, he couldn't, it, it was not an ability to, to rein it in anymore. He just kind of had to keep cranking, you know, cranking those things out to deal with this object that was in his brain. Right. You know, that, that was one thing I thought about all that. You know, he makes, he begins to, he makes that transition from this abstraction to this figurative stuff, which really, in a way, I think, gave him what he wasn't getting from painting the abstractions. It gave yeah. him something. And once that happened, he, it's like he's in. It's like he dropped into a hole. And it, the, the amount of what he does at that point, like the amount of Nixon drawings or the amount of yeah. painting that he does and how it's, it, it's like uh, he's buried into that thing. And... Uh, uh, it's uh, nonstop. This is a, you know, the piece I've been doing now for quite a while. You know, I've been a few years uh, is around fascism, and and I've been making this film uh, myself uh, and a and a, 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 an actress, a performer in uh, Berl in Berlin, uh, Lilith uh, Sangerberg, and we did this. It's a virtual reality. Of where she's uh, <clears throat> Ava Braun and I made off Hitler, and 
it's not an Adolf Hitler in Germany, it's an Adolf Hitler in America. And uh, I, it, it's, uh, it's in a way uh, Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun in the Garden of Eden. And um, it, it came out of this, this sort of thing where I started seeing global politics as organized crime. And uh, it's like a kind of, uh, and, uh, you know, a buffoonery. It's buffoonery in a massive level. Like, it's, uh, you know, is it apocalyptic? I mean, we'll find out. Uh, you know, like, do we, we are find our out. way out of all this, right? And um, uh, that's the question. Do we find our way out of this? And, um, yeah, you know, we hope so, right? Um, the, the one thing to not forget is how powerful the machine is, and the machine is a spectacle, and the machine is, is, is it human, <laughs> you know? Are we dealing yes. in a human thing here? Or are we dealing in what we've constructed? And um, these are drawings, and the drawings are done as performance. I mean, but the bottom of my work is performance. So the subject of delirium is always embedded because it's embedded within performance. And yeah. these are drawings done with uh, Lilith on a platform, and they're, you know, there's, yes, there's, thinking and yes there's writing and yes there's reading but then the action just happens and when you're doing uh, you see we see where it goes right when you're doing work like this uh which really is you know almost a performance does it feel like uh, uh you're exercising something you know in in the way of like an exorcism a demon exorcism like is there a no, yeah, I think all of that is too way too literal and wait you know I said in, at times and it's a silly thing to say hey look I'm not getting any better uh, you know I'm still sick but it, it's not really it, you know I can't really say that because there is something that does I, I am I see things I think things it happens it it makes me think things right so it it gives me thought and yeah. or dreams or whatever so is it an exorcism no i don't want to use those words i yeah. it, it's i don't use words like trance and exorcism and and it, because it it categorizes and yeah. i think these things are about not categorizing and uh you know like uh, it's uh it, 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 you know, you can't categorize delirium. Yeah. We, <clears throat> you can't give it a word. The, it and I mean, that's that, that, you know, famous quote, all language is pink shit. Yeah, right. That's our code. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, the, it seems like starting, maybe I'm wrong about this, but starting with White Snow, where Disney, where Walt, had you know overtones of of Hitler, that since then, the figure of Hitler, the image of Hitler, the idea of Hitler, has been more prominent in the work. And, and is that, I mean, again, not to be too literal, but you know, it's sort of a, a your just awareness of what feels like a creeping fascism, or a return of fascism. Maybe, maybe it's it's never not been gone, obviously, but it, that it's it's become more, it's, it feels like it's on the march again in a way that we maybe haven't felt since World War II. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, you know I, I, it's hard to, you know, like a character like me, or maybe even a character like Gustin, you sort of go into these things and there you are, like, it, you know, why do you do this? Why do you bring up these kinds of images? What's this yeah. about, right? We don't need to see this. We know this. And those, those are all, in a way, they're valid questions. It's, you could just say, hey, this is me. So, um, you know, it's me fumbling and it's me uh, uh, throwing up. It's regurgitating also. But, 
you know, it, I, it's, it's not, it's for me, you know, what do I get back? Well, one thing that's kind of interesting, like the last image you saw, it's, it's Hitler as a bubblehead, right? Yeah. And it's Hitler as, you know, a cartoon. And he, yeah. I don't mean that in a lighthearted sense, nor do I think that those buffoon characters that Gustin is painting and everybody going, oh, they're cute. Well, no, dude, they're not cute. No. <laughs> there, there's a buffoonery going on there that is really, uh, could be horrific. Fine. So yeah. the, the buffoon Hitler, the cartoon Hitler, is maybe what we're up against. It's not, the, it's not that Hitler of the past. Yes, that's a very uh, evil uh, thing there. Those, those unbelievable. But on the yeah. other hand, we're dealing in something else now. Yeah. That has all the characteristics of that old one, that old Hitler. But now right. we got a cartoon, right? Now we got a caricature. Yeah. And it, you know, you look at Trump and you go, that's a caricature. Do yeah. You know, people say it all the time. They're always saying it. You walk down the street, they go, that's all that's like a cartoon. That's a television show. Well, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what it is. Is it a performance? Well, it, it's you a performance know? that affects people's lives deeply and, you know, in very, very, very damaging ways. Yeah, but as a performance, it's, it's, it's this facade up there. It's the cartoon. Yeah. Right. So there we live in another spectacle. It's another thing. It's another form of Hitler. It's yeah. the form of the cartoon, the performance, the, 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 the machine. It's yeah. the machine. Yeah. And uh, yeah, in this case, it takes a, a, a human form. Yeah. We got about five minutes left, and I, there are a couple of there are a couple of questions that came through that I wanted to look at. And one of them, I mean, it takes us a little bit off of what we're talking about, but it's it's actually interesting. Which is, um, it's somebody who's saying that he he'd always uh, associated Gustin's painterly shift um, to a degree with LSD. Not not that Gustin was taking it, but that you know it had by that point in the '60s it had become this this kind of feeling of what LSD did uh, had an effect on what Gustin's, uh, you know, on, on Gustin's figuration. Um, I, I, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. I, no, I, I think, it, you know, that, that's asking a bigger question as to how, how critical was LSD to the, to the culture at large. And, you know, did that just flow into the imagery that Gustin was making? And, he, you know, how did, how was he affected or did he, was he paying attention to cartoon artists like Crumb or S. Clay Wilson or any of this, right? And yeah. I, and which do have connections more to that counterculture of that drug. But I, 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 I don't, you know, I don't think so. Because, because it, it, you know, what was the influence of Gustin to make that kind of imagery? You know, uh, you know, did just like asking, did uh, Enzer take LSD? Well, we don't right. think so. Right. You know, did, but right. did, 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 you did know, Greco like, take yeah, LSD? Yeah, or, like I don't, or, I don't, or Bosch. Bosch. You know, what was going right. on there? You know, how critical are these alternate? I mean, these uh, con conscious altering drugs, and I, you know, it. Yes, they're they certainly have uh, effects, and but I don't know. Uh, you know how critical it is in that situation, like with with Gustin. I, I don't yeah. think so. I think was it's it, uh, for him. I don't, I don't think so. Was it ever? Uh, was that drug ever? It, it, it said definitely there was something going on at the time culturally, but yeah, you know, it, it's it's really. Uh, uh, I think a lot of it is about an artist dealing with imagery, and yeah. it was. Uh, you know, a, a, 
an, an evolution of an artist who's been dealing with imagery all his life. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> this is another question. This is more of a general question about you, your work and about the influence of expanded cinema um, uh, on, on your thinking going way, way back, you know, when, when you sort of made that switch from live performance into, into making uh, films and videos was, you know, the, the world of expanded cinema important and influential to you? Well, you know, I, I was quite lucky that, you know, I, when I was not at the San Francisco Art Institute, but when I was at the University of Utah, uh, there was some young professors who were very into uh, experimental films. And the subject of expanded cinema, like, it, and, you know, that period of 66, 67, I, you know, I met Stan Brackage and I was very yeah. aware of Vanderbeek and uh, Bruce Conner. I wasn't as aware of the Europeans like Kurt Crand or Kabalka. That came later, but the, yes, Bruce Conner, Stan Brackage, Stan Vanderbeek, Andrew Weller Brothers, all this kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, Andy Warhol, you know, so film itself, film, the moving image yeah. is, uh, you know, for me, there's a giant influence. There's three, there's three of them. Well, four, actually, they kind of come in succession. One is, <clears throat> one is happenings and Capro uh, and the history of that whole fluxus movement, art and life. The other one is uh, expanded cinema or experimental cinema. It was more known at that point. Yeah. Uh, I think it's expanded cinema. I think it's a Vanderbeek word. I'm not sure. I think so. And there you end up in a really interesting subject, and that's Vanderbeek and what Vanderbeek was doing. And so you have experimental <laughs> films, Capro, uh, minimalism, uh, minimalism, and then of course connected to Capro is the ready-made and art of the everyday. And those yeah. four things. I'm just in a situation in 1966 where those are the subjects. I'm exposed to that. You know, if you look at artists my age, depending on how fast that happens for them, really has to do with the context they find themselves in. Like, were they in a situation to know who Brackage was, right? Yeah. And I just was. So, and it, it, it that, and then you put on top of that the the cultural period, uh, civil rights, Vietnam, uh, everything that was going on. And uh, those add up to wherever my brain is at right now. Yeah, this is, um, maybe this would be the last question. It is You were, uh, a, a, a woman asked Paul that you mentioned the machine and how it's not human. Um, and she says, but your work is very visceral. And she's wondering about how you know the, the relationship between the machine and the body as as a as a core of your work and i guess in this case the machine can mean you know not just necessarily a physical machine but machines in a more metaphorical sense yeah i mean i think that you know what i, I was talking about the machine in metaphorical sense and in, in the end that the machine is is this uh, this uh, thing we're caught in, of, of, in, in one way you could say it's, you know, in a very blunt way, it's consumerism and capitalism at this point is very blunt that way, but yeah. it's a machine we're caught in. And I think that a lot of my work is about the body, the, the spirit within that machine and, and the effects of that machine on the body. And, uh, and uh, so it's there, you know. So I, you know, yeah, I'm. Uh, I, I, in a way, I keep pushing the body back, and I keep saying, "This is what's going on to us. This is what the body. This is what's happening to the body." And yeah. uh, it, it, and in all of us, you know, and and at the top, you have this uh, hierarchy of uh, of. Uh, of human beings, like the one percent, the white male, uh, you know, this hierarchy that uh, you know uh, services the machine and um, keeps it running. And uh, how do we break that down? 
you know. So, yeah. you know, it's like, yeah, like caught, you know. You know, like Dustin knew who knew he was caught in his body. And he knew yeah. what that body meant, you know. Right. Uh, um, um, okay, so uh, I think we, we should wrap it up. And I, 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 I want to, for people who want to see some of Paul's work, I, I should mention that um, next month, uh, July 14th, there's going to be an online exhibition of um, some recent drawings uh, of, of what he was talking about earlier, the A&E, -A uh, Adolf and Ava, that'll be um, an online exhibition at Hauser, hauserandworth.com, and then uh, a show of some other work um, uh, July 17th in Gestad at the Gallery Carmack 22. Um, so just for people who want to see, see some more of Paul's work. Um, so Paul, thanks for doing this. And, thanks. Um, it was nice to see you again, if only through a laptop screen. Yeah. And Karen, too. Um, so uh, through, yeah, machines. We'll leave, I guess we'll leave this on the, the uh, subject of we're, we're in the machines, and <laughs> they have us. Yeah, they have us. OK. Now, OK, all right. Thanks, Paul. Adios. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>